Hello, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. My name is Eugenie Shu, and I'm on the board of the Raymond A. Wood Foundation. So welcome, everybody. We're going to be hearing today from Ms. Linda Rio. Um, she is an MFT, and she's going to be talking about mental health and pituitary disorders. I'm sure everybody here knows uh, Zoom etiquette now. So if you could uh, keep your, um, your microphones muted. Um, Linda will be speaking for about 30 minutes and then um, she'll take your questions. And if you could um, just write your questions into the chat feature and I will do my best to, um, to ask the questions on your behalf. If for whatever reason um, you have a follow-up question and you would like to actually ask uh, the follow-up question yourself, uh, feel free to um, you raise your hand uh, or just indicate that you'd like to ask the question and um, I can call on you and you can go ahead and ask that uh, yourself directly. But otherwise, if you could just uh, put the question into the chat, that would be terrific. So um, go ahead and take it away, Linda. Thank you very much, Eugenie. And I wanna say thank you uh, to your organization for inviting me. I'm new to your group and very honored. I'm coming from uh, very warm today, Southern California. It's beautiful here. Um, but um, we'd like to move forward. I, I, I found all these Zoom meetings. I mean, it's wonderful that we have this and we've developed this as an adaptation to the pandemic, um, but somehow there's something that's missing with that human to human touch and, and being able to see people live. So I'm just going to imagine people and um, please feel free to ask your questions and uh, we'll move forward a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to make some presumptions here today. Hopefully they're correct presumptions. Uh, first of all, pituitary disorders are classified as rare, but uh, I believe, and I, uh, from my own experience, that a, a lot of them are rarely diagnosed or certainly underdiagnosed. So just to have an awareness of that, uh, whether pediatric or uh, on the adult scale. Um, they affect the internal hormonal system. Uh, with that, affects the external family, initially the family system, which is where I come in. My interest is in human relationships, communication, how we have good, solid um, families to start off as our kind of grounding uh, place, and then hopefully to grow through life and be uh, functional adults. Uh, emotional, cognitive, psychological, behavioral, and relationship aspects of pituitary disorders have very oftentimes been ignored in my experience uh, or unrecognized or just untreated. So that's part of why I'm here today. Um, any, of course, any serious medical illness can be traumatic for not only the patient, but the family as well. Uh, the endocrine system, it has a really special relationship to emotions. Uh, so I think that that's, again, part of why I'm here. Um, I also do want to recognize that we've all been through a pandemic, um, that none of us have come out unscathed, and it has affected every single one of us uniquely and every family as it, a little bit differently. I think some it's been positive and some it's been uh, obviously very, very um, terrifying and bad. So I think we just all want to acknowledge that we're all kind of very collectively together on all of that. I think it's really important to know your own body and practice self-care. It's crucial to healing physical as well as emotional and mental health issues. Um, there's a whole lot of to, to, that I have to discuss here today and I'm not gonna get through it all. So uh, it's the reality, but uh, finding some kind of balance in life, whether it's during a pandemic or dealing with a medical illness of yourself or a loved one, uh, it's still very important. And uh, so today we'll be talking a bit about trying to find those ways of finding balance. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own personal learning cur cur curve moment. Um, before we, just before we went live here, Eugenie was asking me how I got involved in all of this because I'm not a medical uh, practitioner. And quite honestly, in uh, my graduate program, I never heard anything about even the word pituitary, I think it was high school biology that it was first, you know, that I heard about it, and then it was promptly forgotten. Uh, we were taught that the pituitary is the master gland, it was important, but it really didn't come up at all in my training. So 
I have worked for um, over 30 years. Uh, a good portion of my work has been with children and their families for a variety of issues uh, and teens as well. This is a picture of a uh, toy that I've had in my playroom for many years. And I'm going to self-disclose that um, I was first approached uh, kind of in a securitist kind of way about this whole issue. I was doubtful as a mental health clinician because this, I didn't learn this. So I thought if I didn't learn it in grad school, it must not be important. And I try to be on top of um, my literature. And um, so years went on and eventually I wrote a book and, and helped another book. But after I was doing talks, I've done national talks and local talks, whatever about this topic, I was in the playroom with a child one day and I looked down and I looked at this uh, particular toy. Now this represents a mythological creature, um, kind of back from the middle ages where they talked about knights in shining armor and slaying the dragons and the giants. But all of a sudden, and it really was very sudden aha moment for me, I looked at this toy and I went, oh my gosh, the giants of those mythical eras were people with acromegaly. And this is a parody, a very not nice parody of um, someone with acromegaly. Uh, we know from the Bible accounts that um, David and Goliath, Goliath very likely had acromegaly. Um, there have been other uh, uh, history, throughout history, some, some people, we've made fun of them. There have been movie um, people that have uh, allowed themselves to be made fun of in many ways. This is not something to be made fun of and we want to take it very seriously. So I, I just share this because I figured I've been trying to learn and I missed it. I missed it on multiple ways. So when we look at the systems of life, um, I think it's important we start at the center where there's the individual, whether it be biological or uh, emotional and cognitive, um, but we start as a person. But there's these concentric circles that are around us. And certainly when we start off as a child, we have a very close relationship with the people that give us birth or care, care for us, our parents, grandparents, uh, and then, then eventually it's teachers, and then there's the larger um, systems. And I did uh, make note that kind of that macro system, that larger green circle out there, that, that's the one that we've all been impacted by with the pandemic. Uh, I don't think any of us have gone through without some kind of impact. And all of these concentric circles kind of interact with one another. And um, so we wanna just pay attention and there's uniquenesses obviously about each person's uh, systems in their life. Um, and I look at this, um, th there was a child's movie a few years ago, I loved uh, Inside Out. Uh, many of you who are parents are probably familiar with it. Um, but when we look at the pituitary, how it affects the brain, the body, our thoughts, our emotions, our behavior um, and our personal relationships, um, a lot of that has to do with this tiny, tiny little pituitary gland that has a big impact um, internally, biologically, but then has an impact externally um, as well. It has unique effects on each, each individual patient and family, how fast or slow the illness presented itself initially, uh, the length of time to obtain an accurate diagnosis and proper treatment. Uh, those of you who are that are here today, I'm going to guess um, have had the blessed uh, event of being able to find the right kind of uh, centers of excellence, uh, medical centers, people that know what they're doing, um, surgeons, endocrinologists, pediatric specialists, adult specialists, but not everybody does. And uh, some of this has been geography. Again, this is one of the boons that the pandemic has provided is that we have, we've all of a sudden, everybody's used to Zoom. And I think a lot more people worldwide have now access to some of this information. And hopefully some of you today are people that might not have traveled to Philadelphia, for example, but since the pandemic now find yourselves being able to get some really awesome information. So, um, so a lot of that has a lot to do with it. And when we talk about the stress in the model of caregiving, um, you know, each particular illness, and I'm going to say even under the pituitary disorders or even pediatric cancers, 
um, there can be different unique aspects depending on the kind of illness that is impacting someone. And how can families and caregivers um, appraise these stressors and look at them and to assess how they're being affected themselves? I think that's important. And we wanna look at how the man, uh, caregivers cope. Um, just because you have a child, for example, that has a, a very major illness doesn't mean you have any extraordinary skills that you came into the world with. Um, you, you're, you're human, just like anybody else. And so um, we have to work with those, but hopefully enhance those as well, because um, these can be very big challenges. And then the extent or perceived quality of the, the caregiver's social support system. Um, some of these disorders can uh, lead to some isolation, not only of the patient themselves, but the family. Uh, just because it's so intense, uh, at least going through maybe the early diagnostic period and some of the treatment phase period, hopefully beyond that, um, quality of life care um, can be looked at a little bit more uh, intensely. But um, I think it is important to have a support system and to find it. Um, and then how the caregiver is, access, is uh, ex affected by these stressors. Uh, again, each person has biological a capacity to deal with stress as well as emotional support and external um, abilities. So there are some potential positives. I always, I like to come from a strength-based um, kind of perspective and serious illnesses and disabilities can provide an opportunity for healthy family bonding um, that neurotypical families may never have experienced. These are intense, intense stressors. And some families, it can be a boon to becoming close, um, not only as the nuclear family, but their surrounding family. Sometimes people can just bond. You can um, find uh, resources and people like this organization here. For example, um, medical professionals can become very much part of the support system. Um, when you look at the acute or the crisis phase of any illness, uh, the family members can become most, uh, emotionally available to one another in really unaccustomed ways, sometimes stepping up to the plate when you didn't realize that Uncle Joe had the capacity to do whatever. Um, so those are positives. Um, and I think it's important for patients and families to maintain a high degree of autonomy and control over their own bodies. And by that, I mean, I'm certainly not talking about a two, two and a half year old making independent decisions, but certainly parents and even young children. Um, and some of this uh, falls on the weight of the medical uh, community, uh, but certainly for parents to advocate on behalf of children that as much control as they can have. And it might be something simple like, um, if you're gonna get a COVID shot, I want it in this arm versus this arm or I want it up here versus down here a little bit. That is a matter of being able to have some degree of autonomy on your life. It's a little thing, but little things can mean a lot. And I think we wanna give them particularly to children as early as possible inappropriately uh, to their developmental levels and their cognitive levels. But again, as much as absolutely possible, that will reduce the overall traumatic and the negatives of having an illness. When we look at a, a crisis, this happens to be a Chinese symbol for crisis. And uh, the way it's described, I don't know uh, uh, Chinese, but I've been told that this one half of this uh, symbol means danger, the other half is opportunity. And so I like to approach this today as having that, and sometimes we walk that very fine line between danger and opportunity. Hopefully, we're going to find those uh, opportunities as we go forward. In terms of the psychological, emotional, social, and relationship aspects, this is a quote um, from a book that I uh, helped edit, but I love this quote uh, from Dr. Valerie Golden. Despite the important role psycho psychosocial aspects play in the determining the patient's quality of life and overall adjustment to the disease and impact on the family, and others close to the patient, extremely little attention has been paid in the medical and psychological literature to the psychosocial aspects. And I really appreciate that she was able to acknowledge that um, 
a lot of attention is made to the medical, brilliant um, uh, interventions, brilliant medicines, brilliant um, uh, uh, surgical procedures. But a lot of times um, patients are sent home and said, okay, well, you're cured, to, you know, now go home and live your life. But people's lives have been sometimes a shambles. And now they have to find a way to have a quality of life. Um, this, uh, hopefully many of you are uh, very familiar with, when we look at the stress system and the pituitary is part of that stress response system in our, all of our bodies, it's called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus kind of connects to the pituitary, um, uh, the anterior pituitary, which then connects to the adrenal gland. Um, it's part of a system. And uh, so one affects the other uh, and, and the and they all kind of affect many parts of the body, um, the whole system as well. Some people uh, have looked at, be partly because of the geography in the brain of the limbic system. Now the limbic system, I'm not here to, to go into great uh, detail about all this, but the limbic system has a lot to do with our emotions. And the limbic system is just kind of like right next door to the hypothalamus, to the pituitary. And so some people use the term LHPA when talking about pituitary disorders in particular, just because of the effect on the emotional um, system that we all have. Um, I mentioned before that the pituitary gland is kind of called the stress circuit, um, but stress is a very subjective term and uh, it can be experienced I mean, for all of us, we have stress. And I think it's gotten kind of a bad rap. And sometimes in, uh, if you watch news or media where they talk about stress, we all need stress. A certain amount of stress gets us up, gets us going, gets us to go to work, do the responsible things. Um, and some of us crave a little more stress. Those that like uh, roller coasters and exciting things, um, that is kind of stimulating that stress circuit. So there can be some positives to all of that. Uh, and there is a reaction to all of that um, in terms of that. Um, cortisol. Uh, cortisol is a hormone uh, probably many of you are familiar with. It's part of the stress system and part of what happens when uh, our brain uh, suspects something potentially traumatic or is absolutely traumatic. Uh, it has a significant effect on the brain. Uh, it has an effect on the pre prefrontal cortex, which is where our executive functioning uh, occurs, uh, learning, memory, decision-making, attention, verbal skills, all of that. If um, the amount of cortisol is not appropriate or out of, there's a problem with that, obviously this can have an effect on the brain. Um, uh, it affects the, our overall psychology. Uh, cortisol has an effect on our mood. Um, there's a lot of literature that shows depression, anxiety, um, uh, tend to be fairly common with pituitary disorders in general. Um, even to the point where for some people, some people have adults have been diagnosed as bipolar and uh, lo and behold, I mean, they've gone years with having this, have been struggling with this, gone to psychiatrists and therapists and whatever else. Finally, some actually get to a good endocrinologist and find out, oh, uh, maybe they have a little tumor in, in their, uh, on their pituitary gland. And uh, once it's treated, um, that bipolar, bipolarity seems to go away. So um, again, it can mimic other things. Uh, hypercortisolism uh, can lead to atrophy of neurons and decreased ability for the nerves to effectively use glucose, um, uh, as well as some of the trans, uh, neurotransmitters um, that may tend to overfire, uh, and then we don't get that rest time that our brain needs. So obviously then that can impact brain functioning. Um, too much cortisol can affect um, our brain that, uh, and after about three to six months, you know, we have, our brain is intended to allow for short bursts of cortisol, again, to respond to danger. It was never intended to be long-term. Now, whether it's trauma that happens in life, um, particularly childhood trauma, uh, because of family things that happen, things that are out of our control, um, 
that is one reason that cortisol can be affected and can um, uh, be problematic, but also um, just in terms of uh, if we have a tumor that is releasing too much cortisol, uh, and if that's releasing it over a period of time, you're going to, after several months, you're going to start seeing the effects. So in terms of uh, anxiety and relationships, uh, first of all, anxiety is uh, just is the number one reason why most people go to an emergency room because they feel like they're having a panic attack, which oftentimes they are, but oftentimes they think it's a, uh, a heart, heart attack for older people. Uh, so uh, anxiety is very, very common in our culture. Um, this is a one, uh, this uh, particular doctor is uh, very well respected within the field of psychology, particularly in the field of trauma. Um, and Dr. Vanderkolk said, being able to feel safe with um, other probably is the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. We need to feel safe. Safety is so important. And if for some people who have an illness, they may not even feel safe within their own bodies. So for example, for a child, it'd be very important for parents to help develop safe relationships for children that are going through these illnesses, for parents and caregivers to have a lot of safety, friends, people that are understanding, finding doctors that get this, you know, the right kind of doctors. So those are things that can help manage anxiety. Um, and in general, anxiety uh, makes us feel less safe the more anxiety we have. And the more anxious we are, the less able we are to be able to really connect with people. So, um, and those connections, again, are part of the healing process. I won't go through all of these. I'm gonna presume that many of you are very familiar with some of these symptoms. These are biological, physical symptoms uh, that can accompany um, hormonal disorders uh, of many kinds, um, but many of them are psychological and relationship-wise. And many of them kind of overlap uh, and make it difficult to, um, I've, I work with, or I've worked with several uh, endocrinologists who in no way are these easy to diagnose in most cases. Um, we need high level specialists, medical specialists to be able to accurately diagnose and then of course treat. So, but a lot of people, uh, these are missed because of this overlap. And sometimes people will seek help from a mental health professional who doesn't know about any of this and uh, does not refer to, for medical assessment, which hopefully we're trying to educate more and more people about. Uh, major depression uh, is a, a men mental health diagnosis, uh, but very oftentimes can go hand in hand, either primary to the illness, meaning because of that location with the limbic system, it might be directly, but certainly indirectly uh, affected. Um, that hormonal excess and off the charts can uh, cause disruptions in our moods, but also just the idea of having a serious medical illness of this magnitude um, certainly can cause people to feel pretty low and depressed um, diagnostically. Um, and there are, in the literature, there are definite um, citations about a, a high relationship, depending on the kind of uh, disorder that's, that's appearing. For example, over 50% of Cushing's patients uh, present in, in many of the studies with depressive symptoms, uh, even following successive treatment, which could be neurosurgery. So, and we don't necessarily know why or why it's, it, it, it follows afterwards, but it is something to be aware of. Um, and pa patients with major depression have been shown to uh, show increased um, cortisol in their plasma, their urine. So, I mean, it does show up uh, even in people that don't have pituitary or endocrine disorders, uh, just within the regular um, uh, mental health population. Uh, and people with major depression show enlargements and dysfunctions of the pituitary, again, when they don't have a tumor. So there's definitely a relationship here. Uh, we don't necessarily know exactly how close it is, but um, it, it's enough for us to, I think, be looking at this from many perspectives. 
um, and some of the antidepressant treatments have shown, been shown to, to affect the cortisol treatment, so that's important. So this is a listing of just in Cushing's. I just use Cushing's as an example of um, some of the uh, mental health um, uh, uh, symptoms that you're going to see. And for those who are not have, don't have MDs after our name, these are some things to look at, particularly with children and teen, teens. Uh, when you're looking at you know, any kind of head trauma, headaches, some of these are symptoms that could indicate the potential for certainly uh, beyond normal teenage years um, to be assessed. I'm gonna go through these quickly because I do wanna get to the questions. Um, this is some um, uh, slides about the tumors in children. Um, I have a feeling that many of you are pretty familiar with a lot of these uh, on whether they're functional or non-functional tumors uh, does have an effect on mental health. So a lot of times when we have major stressors like all of this, we just have to have a lot of coping skills on the other side, a lot of coping skills. Um, the family and caregivers, a lot of, of stress. And I think it's important to recognize, um, to be able to try to have as good a relationship and building those relationships, in, including with insurance. I think sometimes getting a good relationship with a, an insurance um, uh, uh, case manager can really help. You know, some of them can be very helpful. I have coached some of my, my clients to say my kid or I have a brain tumor, even if technically a pituitary is not in the brain, but if it gets you more treatment, if you get somebody to um, be a little more sympathetic, then I say go for it. Um, and sometimes it's hard to explain all this to family and friends. It's, you know, they see anything inside the head as a tumor. Um, they hear the word tumor and they think cancer automatically. And you hear the word cancer, you think of death uh, for many people. And so a lot of times people shy away. They don't want to talk about it. It's their own fears. And so I think there's skills in trying to find ways, sometimes by having family or friends attend support groups, uh, and there are some uh, across the country. This is how we heal, is by making connections and through research, through professionals, through all of you, and being here today. Uh, connect with your own body. I think we can teach our children to connect, our adolescents to learn their bodies through mindfulness training, through meditation, journaling, there's a lot of um, skills to be learned about paying attention um, and a lot of that healing. Um, someone in, a, in the previous um, uh, presentation talked about uh, the, the importance of physical exercise. I mean, we know the benefits. It helps us mentally, emotionally, and um, uh, all, all ways all around. And uh, in terms of communicating with your doctor, there are ways that I think therapists can help if you go to therapists, they can kind of help you prepare for some of these medical um, uh, appointments. I, I think I hear Eugenie in there kind of bringing me to the end. I just want to make one little mention of play therapy because I think play therapy can be immensely helpful, not just for little kids, but adolescents and adults as well. This is a picture of sand tray. And it can be wonderful ways for children to be able to go through and uh, be expressive and heal if they have been diagnosed and they've been through a medical illness, such as uh, any of these, that um, I think some uh, healing therapy can be very helpful to help them move through. And kids are wonderfully resilient. They're just wonderful. And then family therapy, uh, getting a good family therapist, uh, particularly somebody who uh, understands medical aspects um, I think is, can be really helpful uh, in helping the family talk amongst one another and to find resources and ways to move through these. And, uh, and this is just ways of taking care of one another, uh, including attending conferences like this, uh, going online. If you're going to go to Facebook and social media, I think be uh, discretionary uh, about the groups, make sure that they're positive for you. And you don't want to get medical advice, obviously, from them. But if you want to get support, I think that can be wonderful. Just terrific. So find your own path. Discover your path, your family's path. Um, I think it's unique for every individual person. And that's my book. I collaborated with many, many doctors. 
and here's a couple of resources um, in terms of things. And I'm presuming that these slides will be available for other people. And that's the way to contact me if you do need to contact me. So do we have any questions? Thank you so much, Linda. We do have some questions. <clears throat> So I'm going to just uh, ask them to you in the order that they were written in. And like I said, feel free to um, jump in with a follow-up question um, and you can ask Linda yourself directly or you can chat it in the box and I can, um, I can be your voice. So the first question was actually, I was trying to get people to ask questions. So I put a question myself. Um, I, I think this is a problem that um, affects several of the uh, patients in this group. Um, the question is, do you treat patients with impulse control disorder secondary to these brain tumors, or do you know of research um, around um, impulse control disorders secondary to these kinds of pituitary hypothalamic brain tumors? And if so, yeah. what types of treatments have been most effective? And the impulse control disorders involve things like stealing, yeah. uh, aggression, uh, you know, substance abuse, um, I don't know if substance abuse is so much one of them, but I, I know specifically be, there's, you know, bit, yeah. Yeah. there's a lot of aggression, physical aggression. There's yeah. especially around food, there's stealing, there's yeah. uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I am not aware of any specific but, um, research. Quite honestly, I have been talking for years, hoping we can get some research grants and some people out there, some PhD students are wanting to do some of these research because I think some of these are excellent questions, quite honestly, but I'm not aware of any specific research about that. What I would say is that whether it's directly related to the, um, to the tumor, for example, or indirectly, people who've been um, traumatized by a major life stressor are going to um, reach to a variety of behaviors to try to cope. And so some of that can be impulse kind of behaviors. The other thing that's important to recognize is that because there's been some damage sometimes to the prefrontal cortex, um, there can be some um, lack of uh, ability to um, uh, discern uh, proper timing, uh, uh, reading signals uh, socially, uh, making good choices. So, um, so I would say that in terms of treatment, I don't know that it would be much different than how you would treat anybody with an impulse disorder, except that I think you always um, would want to have a, um, a consultation with the uh, with the treating physicians, just to be care just to be careful. Yeah, a little bit of a follow up down is uh, I think uh, someone commented about the um, impulse control. There's also um, compulsive behaviors. Um, and I happen to know from personal experience, um, and also from doing a, a survey on about 140 craniopharyngioma uh, patients, that it's very common that a lot of these people collect things, mm. um, not just food related, but collect things, office supplies, you know, rubber mm. bands, you name it. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just a very understudied phenomenon. So. Yeah. As you said, there are some, you might inter one could interpret it as a compensatory behavior, but I don't know if we can really conclude that because there is a very high number of these patients who do that behavior and it may have something to do with the damaged hypothalamus. And, and I agree. I think that, I think we don't know directly. I but think we don't know. We need to I study think that, it. So yeah, we need to study it. I think we can say um, uh, that it looks pretty suspicious. <laughs> But from a scientific standpoint, we have to obviously do the data and, and, and uh, data collection and do the research. But uh, I still think that it's helpful for other people to know that these can be commonly, I'll say common fast friends. You know, there are certain things that just tend to occur. And when that tends to occur pretty frequently, you get kind of suspicious that mm -hmm. there could be, it could be both. And sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's yeah. compensatory for going through whatever you're going through. You reach out to a variety of different ways of coping, but it also could have something directly due to brain chemistry. 
Yeah, we just need to know. So, I, I wish I did. Yeah, we will study that. Um, another question is, um, <clears throat> it's, it's a bit general, but it's uh, how do you recommend treating depression for adult brain tumor survivors? Yeah. So do you, do you know of any research that's shown that certain types of therapy are more effective or certain classifications of uh, antidepressants, for example, are more helpful? Um, in terms of antidepressants, um, I'll, I'll just make one comment. Um, this is me personally, and I, I really would like your opinion as well, Eugenie, that um, I don't think that a lot of psychiatrists are very knowledgeable about um, these kinds of tumors. Uh, so my, my personal experience has been hard to find a psychiatrist that um, is either willing to consult or um, learn a lot about this. I'm hoping that that's changing. So I will put that out there. Um, I would say you would, I would never ever want someone to start an antidepressant unless the um, treating psychiatrist was um, intimately consulting with the endocrinologist, the treating endocrinologist. And uh, because that would be extremely important. Um, so the effects of certain, um, uh, for example, uh, benzodiazepines or some of those uh, could have a negative effect. And I think uh, there have been some studies to show that that's not one of those things that they want to recommend. Mm -hmm. but, um, but in terms of um, depression for this population in general, uh, I kind of go to some of the things Eugenie and I were talking about EMDR uh, is certainly as a treatment for uh, a variety of things. It's non-medical. It's, um, it's a method that tends to uh, work with people who have had trauma of one kind or another. Um, but again, I, any kind of mental health treatment should be in conjunction with talking to the, uh, conjunction with getting the okay from the treating medical provi providers. I think that that's just important part of the treatment plan. Yeah, I think I would probably add just a, a general statement about the field of psychiatry. It's it is still very very um, primitive in a way. If you think about it, it's it's one of the few professions in medicine that never examines the the organ. So there are no blood tests. There are no right. There's no there's no no levels taken on anything. It's all the diagnosis is made purely from the patients uh, presenting, presenting problems and their or symptoms. symptoms. Yes. Yeah, and right. so it's, it's very experimental. So patients yes. generally just, you know, there may be certain, you know, SSRIs that are helpful more for anxiety and some that are helpful more for right. agitation, blah, blah, blah. And they just sort of try things out. <laughs> So it is, it's a trial it's a and error. It's a very exact science. And uh, I don't, I think it would be even more complicated to treat uh, a brain tumor patient, such as someone with craniopharyngioma because of all the medical issues. But even with someone who has no medical issues, it's still very uh, trial and error. Yeah, yeah, Until very much, very much so, yeah. Develop better techniques. Yes. Um, let me move on with more questions. Someone did actually ask about EMDR and I think you'd mentioned oh. that it's helpful for- yeah trauma, um, I would say I would not treat it for depression per se, but if there is a traumatic um, reason for the depression, uh -huh. it might right. be useful. But is, did you want to say more about it? The, the question was very general, so I don't know if a person yeah. can speak Yeah, and I don't know if people know I'll just what EMDR is. The, the letters actually are not very descriptive anymore. They were originally, I guess, when it was first developed, but it's a, it's a, uh, treatment modality within mental health. And it doesn't involve, it's not something that involves um, medicines or anything. It's something that the therapist does with, with a person. Um, I would say, uh, I'll, I'll just give a brief example. I worked with this little girl who was um, two and a half, uh, who was, she was not a brain tumor, but she had been born with a genetic disorder um, really profoundly affected she had no speech. She was in a wheelchair. Um, she, when I saw her, she um, had a caregiver with her all the time. Her heart would stop and an alarm would go off. And I mean, it was really intense. And I would think that the family, the, the, the child, that alone would be major traumatic. But that's not why they brought her to me. They brought her to me because um, she had had a major seizure and 
it, it came on very suddenly, it was very dramatic, and she had to be airlifted to uh, the local children's hospital. And it was the sound of the helicopter blades that really was um, frightening her. Even, they couldn't even drive down the street because there were certain noises or if there was a helicopter that went over that she would just absolutely go into a major, major panic. And I used EMDR with this child in conjunction with some play therapy. And um, in a fair, in, she was nonverbal, but it was fascinating. This child was so beautiful. She communicated so beautifully, um, even though without words. And she was able to heal within five sessions. Heal, I mean, she was able to then be functional with her family and, I, and they didn't need her to come back anymore. So it's an example just of sometimes what I might think of might be traumatic or upsetting or the cause of a depression maybe for somebody may not be it. It may be a completely different thing that's unique to that particular person. So we want to see people as individuals and, and, and see what their unique needs are. Thank you. Um, let me see. <clears throat> there, there's a little bit of a discussion going on in the chat about <clears throat> the common um, phenomenon of social impairment um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> with these patients. Mm -hmm. And specifically, there um, are many, um, let's talk about just kids for now, um, but also adults mm -hmm. who um, either lack social skills or lack the desire to connect and bond. Mm -hmm. Mm. with peers they mm -hmm. they often very easily converse with adults mm. but they don't have friendships with peers and I'm wondering mm. if if you have seen that and uh to my knowledge there's no there's no you know we really lack the literature on that and need to yeah. study that more but wondered if you if maybe I missed something if you have any awareness, awareness. no I don't have I don't see any literature like I said I'm going to be honest and say that the the mental health literature is almost nil in terms of dealing with um, these kinds of uh, ranges of illnesses, you're going to find it more in the medical uh, literature. So uh, just that aside. Um, but in terms of the uh, connective things, I'm going to just make a guess, maybe an educated guess, um, either uh, because of some of that prefrontal uh, lobe potential damage that could potentially be directly related to um, the tumor or the after effects of the treatments. Or um, certainly we know that uh, prolactin levels, um, you know, prolactin as a hormone is very important for causing us to reach out and connect. It has something to do with our connectedness. So certainly if that has been impaired in any way, but on another level, if a child, uh, one of the children with these disorders or any has had any type of major illness over a period of time, going to hospitals, going to doctors, whatever, that's going to interrupt their normal developmental connections with children their age, because they oftentimes have had to miss school or they're seen as, uh, you know, different somehow from their peers, um, even uh, external family members. And so they may have missed just some developmental milestones of learning about how to connect. And if they've been around a lot of doctors and nurses and, and treating people, um, they probably have learned how to talk to adults because that's what they've seen and that's what they've been experiencing. So it may make it a little harder for them to know how to deal with their own age group. Um, they've been dealing with things that are far above, you know, what we'd never hope for a child to deal with, but that's what their pathway is. And so, um, so I think that some uh, treatment, either groups or uh, treatments that perhaps are geared towards, you're not going to find very often, I don't think, groups for kids that have had brain tumors of uh, pituitary or hormonal uh, origins, but you might find groups of kids that either have learning disabilities or ADHD or that sort of thing who have interruptions in their social skills. And, and I think those would probably be um, potential uh, resources for parents to, uh, to see if that might be helpful for, the, for their children. Yeah, I think it would be very interesting to do a study on um, looking at the social connection and to peers amongst mm -hmm. um, brain tumor survivors who had pituitary hypothalamic tumors versus mm -hmm. other kids who had cancer treatment, for example, 
leukemia, et cetera, that yeah. didn't go anywhere near the hypothalamus. Um, because th these kids, you know, it'd be interesting to see if they actually don't have a problem connecting with peers. And so right. that might point to the fact of the area of the brain that was damaged, yeah. as opposed right. to the fact that they were in hospitals and had to- There's so research. much research needed. I <laughs> just, just so much. Yeah, that'd be fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, that's something that we will hopefully do with our Chan Zuckerberg Initiative grant. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let me see on the time. We're almost out of time here. Let me see if there's a unique question here. Uh, lots of talk about sort of uh, OCD type of uh, behaviors as well, yeah. which yeah. we referred to earlier with the compulsive behaviors. Yeah. Uh, social skills is another big topic around mental health. Um, do you have, or have you had any experience treating um, patients who have these compulsive behaviors, like OCD-like behavior? And I just wonder if um, I personally haven't treated any any patients like this um, with with exposure and response prevention, which is the you know the gold standard treatment of choice for OCD. Yeah. But I don't know if if you have, if you've ever treated any patients with ERP. Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. Um, but I've had people that have had, I would say not diagnosed, they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for OCD, but it's um, maybe just a step down from that, you know, just hypo. <laughs> it's, that's not a, an official category, but, um, and certainly um, with high, high anxiety levels, I think anxiety particularly, and people uh, will experience their anxiety in a variety of different ways. And certainly those OCD kind of behaviors are, uh, are one big way that that can come out. Now, whether that's directly related to the um, structures, I, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't seen any literature on it. Um, I tend to think that it's got to be, but there's a, <clears throat> actually, yeah. I, I can add some very, something very quick about that. Um, there's yeah. a fascinating mouse paper that actually talks about the AGRP um, um, neuron on the hypothalamus. And um, what they did was they, um, they stimulated this, this neuron and they, and when there was food, it would make the, um, the mice very hungry and they would eat mm. in the absence of food, they would bury marbles. Mm. In other words, they would collect things yeah. and it was like it was compensatory behavior. So it was very similar to kind of what um, hyperphagic kids do when they're collecting non-food items. Yeah. But anyway, there's still a lot to be known about that. There's a um, lot to be known. And it's also important that even when we know that it doesn't mean necessarily we can, that the treatment will necessarily be any different because sometimes treatments um, we're treating the behavior as best as we can, although I think it's really helpful um, for any treatment professional to be very um, mindful that this is a unique person and to take into account their history and their particular illness, uh, the uniqueness of that illness, because I think patients and family members, they just want to be validated for their own experience uh, as a person and their uh, experiences that they've gone through that can be very uh, challenging. Yeah. There's an, there's also mention in here about, um, <clears throat> feel good hormones. I think oxytocin is mentioned here. Sure. Um, someone mentioned, uh, knowing about oxytocin studies related to hypothalamic obesity, but rather than social emotional, but the, actually the original mm -hmm. research on oxytocin was done by, um, Sue Carter from, um, the, she actually is the head of the Kinsey Institute and she studied about voles and bonding. Oh, um, yes, yeah. And social bonding. And so there is a lot of research on that. Um, there was a cranial mom named Naomi Cook who published a case report on using oxytocin. She originally wanted to use it to treat her daughter for hypothalamic obesity, uh, found that it, for whatever reason, it didn't work for that, but it did help her become much more social. So if any of you want to look that up, Naomi Cook is the author of that paper. She's at, she's in Australia okay. and she did publish on um, oxytocin and social emotional improvements. And people, anecdotally, there are some people who, whose kids take oxytocin and have reported it makes them feel okay. more at ease, perhaps more friendly and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm getting a little note. I don't know if you're getting it. Is yeah, we think we need to wrap it up. To wrap it up, but also <laughs> to let people know that they 
if they have questions, they can ask in the in the next um, segment. I guess we're having a. Panel. So you'll be will you be uh, there in the in the last segment? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. So if you have more questions, please save them for the the Q and A at the end. Okay. Thank you, All everybody. Right. By the way. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Bye bye.